Hello and welcome everyone to part one of a two-part webinar series on the topic of women in leadership. I'm Jaren Hart, the Marketing Director at Denison Consulting, and I'll be hosting today's session. We're really excited to be hosting this series in which we will discover what research tells us about leadership and the sexes, the possible root causes and implications for those findings, and insights from senior executives who have broken through the glass ceiling. In today's session, we will be hearing from Lindsay Cordova, President of Denison Consulting, and Barbara Troutline, author of the new book, Change Intelligence, who will help us explore some possible explanations for why there aren't more women in leadership roles. Barbara will be kicking us off, and we'll take about five minutes or so after her presentation to answer questions from the audience. Then we'll turn things over to Lindsay, and we'll plan to hold about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for a Q&A session. So it would be wonderful if you all could submit your questions for Barbara and Lindsay throughout the session by uh, using the questions box in your GoToWebinar widget or by tweeting us at Denison Culture. So let's get started. At this time, I'm delighted to introduce Barbara Troutline, who will share a few key insights from her research on change leader styles and the sexes. Barbara? Thank you, Jaren. Well, welcome everyone. I'm very excited to be presenting today and to talk about these important issues with and opportunities with all of you. As Jaren said, this is a two-part series, and what we'll cover today in part one is, first of all, we'll share intriguing findings from our own and others' research, and that will enable us to discover patterns of results into leadership in the sexes, trends and contradictions, and what they mean for both women and men as leaders. We'll explore the why and the so what through inquiry and reflective dialogue. So please do, as Jaren suggested, and send us your questions to make it very interactive. And then we'll set the stage for a deeper dive into issues and opportunities with our part two panel discussion. As we like to say, women who will help us lift as they climb and break through the glass ceiling. So, what's the business case? Well, by now we're all familiar with the scary statistics. Women outnumber men in the workplace, and actually the majority of college and postgraduate degrees are earned by women in this country. Women control 80% of all consumer spending, and actually over two-thirds of American households are either fully or significantly funded by women's earnings. Women contribute $3 billion to the U.S. economy every year, through women-owned businesses, and actually in the U.S., 40% of businesses are owned by women. But as of the beginning of this year, only 21 women of Fortune 500 CEOs, that, um, or Fortune 500 CEOs are women, that's only 14.2%. And when we look at board of directors of Fortune 500 companies, we see that women only number 16% of those positions. The top five women wage earners per firm make only 68% of the compensation of men doing the same job, and women earn just under 79% overall of every dollar earned by men. We also know that the farther up you go the corporate ladder, the more there are male poten high potential leaders identified and support and resources devoted towards developing men as senior leaders. So bottom line, women do 65% of the work in the world, but only earn 5% of the resources. And we can summarize that by saying that women's voices are not being heard, especially at the most senior rank. Of course, something that's top of mind for us in the US the last few days has been the government shutdown. And it's interesting to look at statistics in our government in terms of representatives that are a representation of women leaders. And we know that at the federal level, only 17% of our legislators are women, and at the state level, it's only 24%. So clearly, a lot of opportunities for women's voices to be heard in all aspects of life from the workplace to the government. The paradox is that we also have research that shows these important findings, that women in powerful leadership positions do make a bottom line difference, that profitability is about 50% higher for companies with the highest levels of women in top leadership. And the more women in leadership positions, the better companies perform in leadership accountability, 
motivation, and other metrics such as employee engagement and retention. So this is really not a nice to do, it's really a bottom line business imperative. Yet we also know that performance significantly increases only when a critical mass is attained. So at least three women on senior management committees. So this is why the conversation that we're having is so vital at this time. What I want to do is move into talking about some of my research results and then to have Denison share theirs as well. So we can, again, talk about some interesting findings, some trends, some contradictions, and what they mean for all of us. So first, my research is around this concept of CQ. So you probably all know your IQ, and you've probably all heard of the concept of EQ, or emotional intelligence. And I say that CQ, or and change intelligence, is one of the critical competencies that leaders need today in our era of mergers and acquisitions, reorganizations, um, new technologies, new processes, shifting workforce demographics, leaders at all levels need to develop the competence and confidence to be able to manage change. So what is CQ or change intelligence? Well, it's the awareness of our own change leader style. And then the ability to adapt one style to be optimally effective in leading change across a variety of people and situations. So it's an important definition when we think about uh, some gender differences and some interesting research results to think about the first step is awareness. So awareness of our behaviors, um, our strengths, our gaps, our blind spots, our developmental opportunities. So first is that awareness. And then the awareness that there are different behavioral choices we can make um, so we can more intentionally have the impact and influence that we're meant to so we can make effective change. So that's the overall definition. And now I'm going to present the model, the CQ or change intelligence model. And as I walk through this model, I invite you to think about what your predictions would be. So what do you think my research has shown in terms of the prevalence of these different change leadership styles across the gender? So which style do you think would be more prevalent among women leaders, which among men leaders? And after I talk about these dynamics, I'm going to invite you to participate in a poll. So um, the first style of change leaders lead change from the heart. So these people have people on their radar screen first and foremost. When there's an impending merger, reorganization, new process change, new technology, new product launch, they think about the impact on the people that they lead that are going to be affected by the change. So they are very engaging, caring, people-oriented. They're very motivating and supportive coaches. So any strength overdone can be a weakness. So people who are very high heart change leaders, they can at times suboptimize. They can at times fail to hold people accountable to demanding new performance expectations and, you know, and hesitate to try to get people out of their comfort zone, which of course, as we know, is a critical part of any change initiative because they might fear disrupting relationships. Also, any strength can lead to blind spots, things that we just miss. And if we, always, if we have people, first and foremost, on our radar screen during change, we might drop out the overall goal or the vision of the change. So the second style of change leaders leading change from the head always have the vision and the future and the big picture on their radar screen. What excites these people are looking towards the future, looking at new business horizons, trends that are impacting their industry and their organization, what's happening in the marketplace, the competitive environment, the economic climate, and they love to bring their new thinking and innovative ideas and solutions back to their organization. So leading change from the head, these folks are very strategic, futuristic, purpose-oriented change leaders. They're the inspirational and big picture visionaries. However, in their zeal to move forward towards exciting new futures, Sometimes these folks can look around and look behind them and realize that they've left their people behind, that nobody's with them. They've taken their eye off the ball in terms of the people leadership aspect of the change process. And also sometimes they can be so excited for the future and the strategic goals that they, even if people are on board and with them and enthusiastic, 
they might just not know how to get from here to there because the high exchange leader has not shown them that roadmap. The last style of leading change, leading change from the hands, they love that roadmap. They're all about the process and the tactics of change. They're very efficient, very tactical, process-oriented change leaders. They're a planful and systematic executor. So excellent project managers, for example. What can they at times drop out? Well, sometimes they can fail to see the forest for the trees. They can be focused on being efficient versus effective, focus on the process versus the people. So those are the three main styles of change leaders. Now, of course, we're all blends of all three styles, but most of us tend to have a dominant style. So now I'm going to invite you to participate in a poll. And I want you to think about what would your prediction be? And we can launch the poll at any time. Excellent. I see the poll is open. Would you predict, predict that women are more heart-focused in their change leader styles, that women are more head-focused, or that women are more hand-focused? Of course, you could have done this for women and men, and we just chose one gender. And so which do you predict that women would be? Or do you predict that there would be no significant differences between men and women, or are you unsure? And just to take a step back, and um, tell you a bit about the CQ assessment, uh, the instrument that this research is based on is a um, self-report. So people answer it about themselves, which is a nice um, uh, segue into the Denison research, which is both self and other reports. So this is all about people's perceptions about themselves, their own styles, their own behaviors. Um, it's 20 questions, it's online, um, and, it, and it asks people to uh, respond to questions about uh, whether they, you know, how much they focus on the heart, head, or hands in change leadership. And the result then is a customized report where they learn more about their one of seven change leader styles. So again, we're all blends. So if you put the head, heart, and hands words together, you get one of seven change leader styles that you fall into. And you understand more about your strengths, your blind spots, and get some coaching hints about targeted developmental opportunities. So that's a bit about the assessment itself. So let's see the results of our poll. And the survey says that you know, the, um, the audience predicts that 59%, 59% of the audience predict that women are more heart focused. Um, nobody that they're more head focused. 20% um, that women are more hands focused. 20% that there's no significant differences. And 2% that we um, are unsure. And in fact, let me go and show you now um, what the results say. You are a very savvy audience. So um, if we can go back to sharing my screen, that would be super. Thank you very much. And in fact, we do see that there is a significant difference between the change leader styles of men versus women. That as you predicted, um, women are um, uh, more than uh, almost half of women are heart-focused change leaders, that they lead with the heart. Um, as you can see, the red area of the women pie chart, 44% of women tend to lead change with the heart, as opposed to men, almost half of men tend to lead change with the head. Um, so men tend to be um, looked at and behave as more of visionary change leaders, strategic, big picture, future oriented. Women tend to lead change by focusing on uh, the people involved and engaging, communicating, collaborating. Now, the way to look at this is men tend to focus more on results and women on relationships that facilitate results. Um, this is consistent, of course, with much research that's done about women's leadership styles um, and also some interesting research that was done by Harvard recently that showed that men, that women in general on 360 feedback are rated higher on all leadership dimensions than men except when you come to visionary leadership. And that's the one area where men were significantly rated higher than women. And these results are consistent with that. So what are the implications of this? Well, I think there's several. When I coach women leaders, um, you know, we talk about the fact that there's good news here in these results, that people the world over long for more people-centered leadership, more communicating, collaborating, engaging. Um, we know that leading successful change um, mandates that we have involvement, that we have two-way feedback, that we build trusting relationships. And so people report, again, 
liking to report to women leaders. Um, we support our team and our customers through the change process. However, there's also a cautionary note, and that is that for women who do aspire to senior leadership positions, and not everyone does, but for women who do, are we taking the time to lift our heads up out of the day-to-day, -day, out of the supporting our teams, out of the you know kind of making it real in the field and being in the trenches, are we taking the time to share our strategic thought leadership? to make our voices heard, to, um, to give our opinions in terms of trends that are impacting the business and, um, and future directions that we might want to look at, and throwing our names in the hat for, um, for, for new roles that would stretch us in new ways. Um, are we doing those things? Um, because again, I think if we look at, for example, um, you know, Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook, her book that came out in the spring, uh, Lean In. Her, one of her messages was that, of course, there's two sides of the equation. There are systematic biases in our society and organizations that prevent women from breaking through the glass ceiling. We know that and we have to address those. However, importantly, there are also internal barriers that, um, that we might have, uh, behaviors we engage in often or sometimes at least unknowingly, unwittingly, that might stand in our way. So as I said, the first step was um, being a, a truly impactful change leader is awareness of your own style, awareness of your own behaviors, and then being more intentional about the choices that you're making. Um, whether it's to lead effective change and to make sure that you're giving people what they need to get it, to want it, or to be able to do it, right, the head and the heart or the hand. Because um, so often it's that people don't e either get it, right, they don't understand the big picture of change, they don't want it, they're afraid of it, um, they don't trust the leaders, um, they haven't had an input into it or they just don't know how to do it. They haven't been given the roadmap, the tools, the training, or there's barriers in their way. So both, all, both genders need to be able to engage in behaviors that, that facilitate effective change. And also, for women leaders, it's the opportunity, since this is a, an assessment that focuses on behaviors, that, that we can change. It's not immutable personality characteristics, that are we making be balanced behavioral choices? Are we at times doing what we need to support our people and our teams? And are we at times doing what we need to do to make sure our, that our organizations get our best thinking and that we're also simultaneously looking out for our careers and well-being as well? So one final note um, before we open it up for some questions that I would share is that a cautionary note. As you saw from the pie chart, over a significant percentage, over a third of men do start with the heart, that are heart-oriented change leaders. And a substantial number, over a quarter of women, do lead with the head, visionary leaders, when facilitating change. Both of these groups can be feel misunderstood. So we know that the stereotype threat is a real one, that for women who are, have a more driver, sense of urgency style, um, that they can be perceived as aggressive or even arrogant versus assertive. And we know that for men that have more of a people team oriented style, more coaching style, that they can be perceived as not as strong leaders as is ideal. And that's because they are behaving in ways that are counter to our stereotypes of men and women. And not only can they feel misunderstood, but they can actually be penalized in organizations in terms of the rewards that they get, the promotions they get, the opportunities they get because of behaving in these, um, in these ways that are counter to our expectations. So the point is that to recognize that while there's a statistically significant difference, there are a significant portion of men and women who do lead in ways that might be counter to our stereotypes, and that change intelligent teams and organizations embrace all perspectives, so people at all levels are empowered, engaged, and equipped to partner together to lead mission-critical transformation. Because again, we need all those perspectives. We need head, heart, and hands. It's about the balance. It's about recognizing your strengths, shoring up your blind spots, and creating an environment in our organizations where we can get the best from the brightest and have all voices heard. So that is what I wanted to share. Um, Jaren, I'll ask you now, is there any questions from the audience that we can address? 
Thanks, Barbara. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Maybe we can take a couple of minutes to answer a few. Uh, Diane sent us a comment saying that she found it interesting that for men, hands came in a distant third. She says she would have guessed that hands would have ranked higher than heart for men. We were curious if you had any insights into why, into these findings. Yeah, I think that that's a fascinating question. And definitely, um, women are primarily head-oriented. And they do have a strong hands back up. And men were, were very much lower on that. And, um, and what we look, it would be another thing that we didn't talk about, but if we look at differences by hierarchical level in organization, as maybe not be surprising, um, uh, we see more head-oriented change leaders at the upper levels, executive levels, more hands-oriented in the middle levels um, in project managers, and more heart-oriented change leaders at the frontline levels, at the supervisory levels. So men, and that's uncorrelated with gender, so men, regardless of their level, tend to, folks tend to behave more like strategic executive level leaders, whereas women, regardless of their level, tend to be functioning more like supportive frontline coaches or um, execution-oriented middle manager. So I do think that those also are some interesting findings. And, um, you know, I, I love when I, when I look at the percentages overall of the three change leader styles, um, uh, we see more heart-oriented leaders, somewhat more than 40%, somewhat less than 40% head-oriented change leaders. And the smallest percentage is hands-oriented change leaders for either sex. And so I think that's fascinating because a few years ago there was a great book that came out um, by Bossidy and Sharon, a Harvard researcher and an ex-CEO called Execution. And when we look at execute, and what their, what their point of writing the book was is that we can get so enamored by the latest sexy strategy. Um, and we also know so much about the, the power of engagement and the need for engagement that what we can drop out is the execution, is the actual doing part of it. And that's where the hands folks come in. So I think that if we look at the fact that 70% of major changes fail or at least suboptimize to reach their goals, um, I think so much of it has to do with a failure in execution. With we, we have good sound strategies, we you know, often have you know, decent engagement and two-way feedback, but we just don't take the time to really implement effectively because of all the changes going on. And perhaps we also don't make the time to install wedges to prevent um, backsliding um, and also to make sure that change is sustained. So those are a few comments that I have in terms of just, you know, and we can also undervalue those skills. We can undervalue the executional, the tactics, and we can at times overvalue people who bring that visionary perspective to our organization. Thanks, Barbara. You know, at this point, I think we'll actually move on to hear from Lindsay, and we'll spend some time later on in the session addressing some of the other questions that have come in. Um, so at this point, it's my pleasure to introduce Lindsay Koderbaugh, who will share some interesting findings from the Denison research on perception and women leaders, and also uh, the implications of some of the topics we've covered today. So I'll pass it over to you, Lindsay. Great. Thank you, Jaren. Um, so I'm really happy to be here today to share with you some of the research that Denison's been doing around gender and leadership issues. So most of the research that we've conducted can be grouped into three main buckets. So first, we really sought to understand pretty broadly, more in general, whether the gender of a leader impacts how they both perceive themselves as well as how they're perceived by others. And so while I know this basic question has been addressed by many researchers, often what you find is those results of that research can be pretty mixed. And we also specifically sought to understand whether there are differences between how male and female leaders are perceived around the aspects of effective leadership measured by the Denison model. Um, but beyond this basic male-female differences question, we've also investigated some of the factors that may impact these broader gender and leadership trends. And finally, we really tried to take a closer look at the potential reasons for the continued existence of the glass ceiling. So that's kind of a high-level overview of some of the research that I'm going to be going through with you today. As I mentioned, our research is focused on understanding differences between male and female leaders around the Denison model. So just to give you a broad overview of what that model is, in case you're not familiar, the Denison model of effective leadership covers four broad traits of leadership, each measured with three more specific sub-indices that are made up with eight survey items each. So at, at just at a really high level to kind of walk around the model, these four broad traits are measuring the following things. So if we start with adaptability, which is the kind of blue area of the model, 
Um, adaptability is all about the leader's ability to translate the demands of the organizational environment into action. So does that leader, does he or she instill a sense of customer and market focus in the organization? Um, do they instill a sense of importance around creating change and flexibility and learning from mistakes and things of that nature? Moving over to the mission area, the red area of the model, um, mission is all about defining a meaningful long-term direction for the organization. Does the leader share a compelling vision, align people around strategies, track against stated goals, and those sorts of behaviors? And when we look at consistency, the yellow area of the model, we look at the leader's ability to provide a central source of integration, coordination, and control in the organization. And finally, kind of last but not least, when we look at the green area, the involvement area of the model, what we're really capturing there is the leader's ability to build human capability, ownership and responsibility in the organization. It's more the, the people-focused kind of quadrants of the model. So this model is measured through a 360-degree feedback instrument. We've already kind of mentioned that before. So leaders rate themselves, but are also rated by their bosses, their peers, their direct reports, other key stakeholders, both internal and external to the organization. So this, this model and this survey tool really allow us to explore not only how leaders perceive themselves, but also how they're perceived by others, which can be, there can be some really interesting dynamics that kind of play out in those two different sets of perceptions around male and female leaders. So starting with the first kind of broad level question around research um, around gender differences. So research investigating differences between how male, male and female leaders are perceived have generally tended to show mixed findings. So some, some studies show male leaders tend to be rated higher than their female leader counterparts. Others show female leaders are actually the ones that tend to be rated. Others show it kind of depends on the behaviors that you're talking about. And still others show, you know, at the end of the day, there's, there's not much difference there at all between how male and female leaders are rated and perceived. Uh, but at the most basic level, you know, we focused on the traits of the Denison model and sought to understand whether there were differences in how male and female leaders were perceived themselves and how they were perceived by others. So to conduct this research, we used a really broad sample of leaders from a wide range of organizations and industries. And we did this to kind of take a high level bird's eye view at this question and to ensure that the findings that we came across were pretty highly generalizable. So taking that kind of broad sweeping sample perspective, what we found was that when it comes to self-perceptions, female leaders rate themselves significantly lower than their male counterparts on the adaptability and mission areas of the Denison model. So in other words, women rate themselves lower in areas like communicating a clear vision, aligning employees around strategy, and encouraging flexibility and change. So these findings somewhat echo what Barbara has found in her research in that the mission area of the Denison model maps closely to the leading with head concept of her framework, which she found not to be to, not to be a predominant change leadership style for women. So there's some consistent findings there. But while women seem to perceive themselves as less capable in these areas than their male counterparts, other raters don't seem to hold the same perceptions. In fact, our research shows that by others, so bosses, peers, and direct reports, women are rated significantly higher than their male counterparts in most areas of the Denison model, including mission. But as we mentioned, this is a pretty broad sample of leaders, so we wanted to also understand whether there were other factors that impacted these trends. And one of the factors that we looked at was the age of the leader. We uncovered some really interesting findings when we started to consider how age played a role in this equation. So I know these graphs may be a little bit difficult to follow, so I'll just kind of talk you through the results. Uh, but basically, what we found was when looking at self-rating, so that's the top graph I'm focusing on there, older and younger male leaders tend to rate themselves pretty similarly. So that's noted by the red circle on the right, and that those two lines in that top graph are pretty close together within that red circle on the right. So that means you know, male leaders, whether they're under 40 or over 40, tend to rate themselves pretty similarly. But when we look at female leaders, what we find is that female leaders under the age of 40 rate themselves significantly lower than female leaders over the age of 40 do. And that's seen by the larger red circle on the left 
in that top graph. So there's some really interesting dynamics playing out there. But in addition to these self-perceptions, as we just reviewed on the previous slide, we found that others tend to rate female leaders higher than male leaders. So how does age play into others' perceptions? When factoring in age, we can see that this trend is particularly true when looking at leaders over 40. That is, for leaders under 40, there's very little difference in how male versus female leader, leaders are rated. So if you're now shifting to look at that bottom graph, that turquoise line, the lighter blue line in the bottom graph is pretty flat, showing that regardless if you're male or female, when you're under 40, others are rating you pretty similarly. But when looking at leaders over 40, female leaders are rated much higher than their male leader counterparts. In fact, they're the highest rated group of any of these um, leader dynamic groups. And actually, male leaders over the age of 40 are the lowest rated group of any of these kind of groups. So while these graphs were specific to the consistency trait of the Denison model, these results are pretty similar across other areas of the Denison model as well. So we just kind of pulled this, this one trait out as an example. So I think these results are potentially important um, because they point to the importance, I think, of mentoring and coaching for younger women leaders. So this group of younger women leaders rate themselves lower than any other group. And so um, it's likely that these women could really benefit from having more experienced female leader role models. As interestingly, women leaders over 40 both perceive themselves and as well as are being perceived by others is quite skilled in the areas of effective leadership. But beyond age, we also looked at the industry in which these leaders worked to explore whether that had an impact on how male versus female leaders are perceived. There's been a lot of research done in the past that has shown that aspects of the work environment then that can make gender more salient can actually enhance gender biases. So with that in mind, we wanted to understand how male versus female leaders are perceived in male-dominated versus female-dominated working environments. So starting to dive into that question a little bit, looking just again at the, at the consistency trait of the Denison model as an example, these results show us that in male-dominated industries, women and men rate themselves pretty similarly, shown by the left circle and those two lines in that graph being pretty close together. However, when working in female-dominated industries, women rated themselves higher and men leaders rated themselves lower. Looking now at others' ratings, so shifting from self-perceptions to others' ratings of these leaders, so this is boss ratings in particular in this example, we see a pretty similar pattern. Men leaders were generally rated higher in male-dominated industries by their bosses and lower in female-dominated industries while women leaders were generally rated higher in female-dominated industries by their bosses and lower in male-dominated industries. So women leaders are perceived more favorably when working in an environment that's congruent with their gender. Uh, but the same is also true for men. What I think is partic particularly interesting here and might be interesting to think a little bit more about around these findings stems way back to how we encourage young boys and young girls in their career paths. So, for example, many have cited that young girls are often dissuaded from pursuing math and hard sciences and things of that nature. And that likely has an impact on career paths later in life and on genderedness of industries and those sorts of careers. And so I think that's just kind of an interesting consideration, something to further explore as we're trying to understand the dynamics of gender and leadership. So while these findings are interesting, we also really wanted to dive in and investigate potential causes for the glass ceiling more directly. So in doing so, we recognize that the gender distribution of middle managers is more evenly dispersed across men and women. And it's not really until you get to those higher levels of leadership where you begin to see greater proportions of men and fewer women. So there are more men in the C-suite, and it is those individuals who are likely making decisions about which middle managers to groom and which to set on the path for, for promotion and which ultimately to bring up with them into the C-suite. So our line of thinking around this was that it might be valuable to look specifically at how top management, those folks directly involved in promotion decisions, view male versus female middle managers, those being groomed to go up into the C-suite. So given this logic, we thought 
we might be able to shine more light onto the glass ceiling by taking a look very specifically at whether there are perception differences between how top male managers view how top managers view male versus female middle managers. And what we found when we did this at least was um, initially surprising to us in that women middle managers were perceived more favorably by top management than their male manager counterparts. So perceptions, kind of to our surprise, perceptions of top management didn't seem to shine any light at all onto helping explain why the glass ceiling still exists. So interesting findings, but left us kind of scratching our head a little bit. So if these top leaders are perceiving women so favorably, why is there still a glass ceiling? So in combination, these studies on you know, differences more broadly, how age factors in, how industry factors in, what top management in particular is thinking, show that while women themselves, particularly younger women, may perceive themselves less favorably than their male counterparts do, others tend to rate them more favorably. And this is particularly true of women over the age of 40, and it's also true of people in top management positions, those that are making the decisions. Um, so given this, we were left wondering if women are perceived in such a positive light, why is there still a gender disparity in top management positions? More broadly, in thinking about this, what we concluded is that perceptions about leaders, which is what we were investigating in all of these research studies, aren't really telling us much and don't really explain why there's still gender disparity in top leadership positions. In general, we concluded that these sorts of more overt biases don't play as significant of a role as they did years ago. And what we should really start to be looking at and focusing on are some more subtle explanations for, this, for, for why there's still a glass ceiling. And if you've read the most recent issue of HBR, which we kind of feature here, you'll notice that we're not alone in this line of thinking. So this September 2013 HBR article talks about what they're calling second generation gender bias and discuss how women are less likely to face more overt bias in the workplace. So whereas a couple of decades ago it would have been these results likely would have been completely different. And you would have probably have seen women leaders being rated less favorably than male leaders, particularly at higher levels of management. But that level of overt bias, overt perception differences is is not as common in the workplace. But women do still face a number of more subtle challenges. And this is what they're calling second generation gender bias. And some of what they mention in this article actually links pretty closely back to the research that we just reviewed and have conducted here at Denison. So some of the things that they point out and mention in this article are things like having a lack of role models for aspiring women leaders and that being a, uh, a critical factor in why we still have a glass ceiling and why it's difficult for women to advance into um, higher level leadership positions in organizations. And they also talk about gendered career paths and gendered work tracks. Um, and gendered roles within organizations and the impact that that has on maintaining the glass ceiling. And again, I think that ties right back to the really interesting industry findings that we were having. And so I think the, the, our, our findings are interesting and, and, and speak to um, and help kind of inform the issue of gender disparity in leadership positions, but I do think that the focus of research, the focus of attention is kind of to pay a little bit more attention to these second generation gender bias issues and to think about what we as women and we as women leaders um, can do and help support in our organization to really kind of address those sorts of factors as opposed to the kind of more overt, more overt gender biases that have maybe been um, in, in attention in years past. So, in sum, I thought I'd wrap up by sharing this, you know, somewhat funny <laughs> little cartoon that I feel helps illustrate the point that while overt bias may be less common, second, gen second generation gender bias is still alive and well in organizations and is likely playing a key role um, in maintaining gender disparity in upper level leadership positions. So, with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Barbara, who will talk a bit about um, what our next steps are in this two-part webinar series. And now that we've kind of set the stage with some of this background research, what we're really hoping to do to continue to be able to um, address some of these questions in a more concrete and specific way. 
Thank you. Thanks so much, Lindsay. I just find your results so fascinating, and I just really look forward to the questions from the audience so we can take a deeper dive. Um, so we wonder, how can women position themselves as credi credible candidates who break through the glass ceiling or into a board seat? Um, if you look at these very interesting self and other perceptions, if you look at the very interesting behaviors in terms of women um, positioning themselves and acting like visionary leaders or strategic thought leaders, what can they really do? And also importantly, how can your organization leverage the proven power of women's leadership at the most senior levels? As we talked about, it's a business imperative. There are bottom line business benefits to having more women in senior leadership positions. And you know, it's interesting. There are things that we as women can do for ourselves. Um, and there's also, you know, it's, it's also, I mean, the executive men that I work with are also very interested typically in these type of issues because they, you know, as, as they get to be more senior leaders, experience some age biases themselves. And also, as they have daughters entering the workforce, they see for themselves also um, the, the obstacles that stand in the way of their, of their daughters moving forward. So I think there's, you know, in terms of the partnership between men and women looking at these issues. And as um, Lindsay just said, what can these women do for ourselves and, um, and other women? And then what can uh, we do in terms of our organizations to overcome some of this second generation um, uh, biases in terms of gender career paths and roles and expectations. So on the next slide, more specifically in our second session, what we're going to explore, and it, our agenda is, is rather fluid for our panel discussion, we're going to hear from these five amazing senior level women who have broken through the glass ceiling and what they wish they had knew, known back then and, and their career paths, their journeys. But also, what we talk about is going to be informed by the questions that are of interest to, the, to our audience. So questions you pose now, um, questions that you pose when you register for the session. So we definitely want it to be very dynamic and interactive and focusing on what's top of mind for you. So you're going to hear specific tactics that you can apply immediately to make a difference for your career and those of other women um, and the bottom line of your organization. Get exposed to what works. So moving from the research focus, which is very important and enlightening, um, to looking at what are specific actions that women have taken that have been effective and what can you do to channel your strengths and showcase your effectiveness. Um, so you'll have some actionable strategies for positive self-promotion, self-advocacy, to plan for your career next step. And how can you as women get on the radar screen to achieve the influence and impact you were meant to um, so many of us feel like the best kept secrets, and how can you move from that to the next big success? So that's kind of a, a teaser about what we will, um, what we hope to accomplish uh, next week. So, um, Jaren, now I'll turn it back over to you to see what other questions we've gotten from our audience. I invite our audience to type in for Q and A questions, um, uh, even raise your hand, and we will uh, we will field those now. Great, thank you, Barbara. We've got a couple of questions lined up for you both. Um, so Barbara, we'll start with a question from you. This question is from Tina, and Tina asks, how specifically can women position themselves as strategic thought leaders capable of contributing at the executive level? I think that's a great question. I alluded to some of those strategies earlier where we can take the time out to lift our heads up out of the day-to-day -day. and to Diane's question before about was it surprising that more men are heart focused I think yes to me it was and, and I've even seen that dynamic of um, you know male leaders in steel mills and heavy industry so very male dominated environments is still a significant part, portion of men who are heart focused and much lower hands focused but women do tend to be more heart and hands focused so looking at the details sometimes the smaller picture um, which is great for execution and getting changes implemented, but again, how are we positioning ourselves positively for our careers? So again, taking the time to um, balance that hands and, and heart focus with looking at what are we seeing on the horizon? You know, can we go to conferences? Can we read journals? Can we, you know, engage in our own smart thinking and share them more broadly with senior leaders in our organizations? Can we do what Lindsay just said? and identify a sponsor in our organizations or multiple sponsors, multiple mentors, um, you know, whether they be women or men um, that have taken career paths that, that we might aspire to. How can women throw their names in the hat for stretch opportunities? We know also from research that men are so much more likely to um, 
to go for promotions or go for special assignments, even when they only meet a few of the criteria, whereas women want to make sure that they are totally experienced and, and you know, kind of can check all the boxes of the competencies look for. Um, you know, how can women take more strategic risks with their careers? And in keeping with that, how can women look for opportunities to have a broader um, base of experience? I know this is going to be a theme of our panel next week. How can we move from having maybe especially staff roles to more operational roles where we have a bottom line profit and loss accountability? Um, so how can we really, um, you know, again, throw our names to the hat for either special projects or different kind of roles, you know, broaden our experience and get more visible. Um, uh, another thing that women tend to often do is give credit to others instead of also giving credit to ourselves and sharing that appropriately and when it's the right thing to do and when it's legitimate. Um, there's a book that I love called Brag, and the subtitle is The Art of Tooting Your Own Horn Without Blowing It. I love that title, and it's by a woman named Peggy Klaus. And I've recommended it to both women and men leaders um, in terms of, again, um, looking at what are, some, how, what are some ways that I can talk about my achievements, my accomplishments, and those of my team in a way that make others smarter, that show people um, how we've been successful, you know, again, um, highlight some, some things that we've done right um, so we can, again, you know, learn the best practices and leverage them, and then also simultaneously in a way that gets ourselves noticed and furthers our, our careers as well. So it's the balance. So those are some thoughts on that topic. Great, thank you, Barbara. Um, I'm going to I'm going to pose a question to Lindsay from the audience. This one is from Terry, who asks, "Do you think your findings are contradictory to previous research that showed men to be more visionary leaders than women?" Actually, that's that's a, that's a really interesting question, and I know Barbara um, talked a little bit about that research um, in as well, um, that there, there is a, a line of research that has shown that, you know, in general women are rated higher on 360 instruments, um, except for when it comes to visionary sorts of behaviors. Um, our findings are somewhat contradictory to that, I suppose, in that we, we find consistency when you're looking at women's self-perception. So women themselves are not rating themselves as visionary as male leaders are. But we don't find that when we're looking at others' ratings of those leaders. And uh, while that's somewhat contradictory, I think we don't really know yet the, the explanation behind that. And there's a, a couple of different ways to think about that. I mean, I think one thing that we always have to keep in mind with this, with this, this sort of research is what we were measuring as perceptions of leaders. And I think what would be a really great research step forward would to be to have some sort of um, objective criteria that we could include in these sorts of studies as well. Because um, you know, one potential explanation is that because gender bias and the women of the issue of gender disparity in leadership positions is so salient to organizations and so salient to leaders, there might actually be an overcompensation issue going on with others' ratings of women leaders because they're so sensitized to this issue. I, don't, I can't say that that's the case for sure, but um, it's a possibility. And I think having some objective data um, around leadership would be really helpful in kind of sorting that out. So I guess the short story would be um, our, our results are, are somewhat consistent and somewhat contradictory. And I think um, helping continue to do research and take, it to, take the, the, le the research to the next level um, would, be, would be really helpful. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, Barbara, we've got another question that maybe you can speak to. Uh, Sherry has uh, Sherry says, I read Lean In and listened to the TED Talks. What other recommended readings or talks would you recommend? I know you mentioned Bragg. Are there any additional pieces that you would point the audience to? Um, that, that's a really great question. Um, I definitely think some of the Harvard research that, that Lindsay mentioned and um, is, is, is very good to, to check out. Um, what other specifics would I look at for um, women building their leadership skills? Um, hmm. There's so many good sources out there. Um, um, well, as you, as you think on that, um, yeah. Maybe I can ask you a different, pose a different question that gets more at the, the book bragging that you mentioned. You know, another question was how can, can women engage in proactive self-promotion and overcome a fear of appearing to be bragging? 
Right, exactly. And I think, you know, again, women and men, I've coached some very humble men leaders that, you know, have these issues too. And I, um, uh, you know, again, part of it is, is, is your mindset. And part of it is looking at it as something that is a negative and it is bragging versus looking at it as something that, that you're actually being selfish if you don't. <laughs> that you're, you're playing small, you're depriving others of your thought leadership, your good thinking, your sound strategies, your successes by not sharing it. So I think part of it, as so much of this, starts with our own mindset of ourselves as leaders and our contribution. And so looking at it as, um, as positioning it in terms of what are some specific successes that we have had. And, um, you know, we did this, and I think this other project can learn from that. Or when we were able to achieve this goal, this is the steps that we took. Or, um, you know, or when, you know, I was at this conference, or I read this resource of this book, or, um, you know, was, that, was in this other meeting, you know, bringing that sort of thinking back to the issue and the task at hand. Um, I think always, uh, you know, prepping ourselves, especially in before important meetings, before meetings were highly visible with senior leaders, is to think about how do I want to be perceived as a leader in this situation? And what are one or two or three key points that I want to get across um, that I think would, you know, again, position myself and make me perceived as a leader the way I want to be, but also further that meeting's agenda and our team's agenda and our organization's agenda. So again, it first starts with you know, a kind of a mindset shift. And then thinking about to make ourselves comfortable, I'm kind of engaging in some self-coaching and to have some specifics um, that we are going to, um, we're going to bring forward. So both the, you know, the mindset as well as some specific tactics and behaviors. Um, and again, it's like any competency. The more we're aware of it and the more we um, have uh, you know, uh, a reason to, uh, to develop and improve, um, and the more we practice, the better that we are most likely going to get at it. Great. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, we've got two similar questions that I'll pose to Lindsay. Um, they are, have you all looked at any research that focuses specifically on ethnicity or minority women as it can be also perceived as a roadblock? And then Heather asks, I'm interested in whether or not there was any variance in terms of the surveyed women's race or culture, age, et cetera. What was, what information, what was that information captured as part of the research? Thanks. Yeah, I think those are, those are both really great, great questions and the race ethnicity piece of this is definitely something that's been top of mind for us. Um, to answer it honestly, we haven't done that research yet, but we plan to. It's, it's in the kind of works of the next stages of, of what we'd like to look at in terms of the contingencies of how to break down this kind of broad level, the broad level trends that we're seeing and, and see how race or ethnicity has an impact, um, but it's not something that we've looked at yet. That being said, though, there, there are a lot of um, great resources and studies out there that do look at the combination of um, gender and and minority status from a race or ethnicity perspective and, and referring to that as kind of like a, the double bind and what impact does that have on um, women in leadership positions and how they're perceived and what barriers does that pose. So um, in the absence of being able to speak to that directly from our own research, I would, uh, would point you to, to those studies um, for, for future reading at this point. Uh, there's a question from Kimberly that I'd like to pose to both Lindsay and Barbara. Kimberly's question is, in a recent experience, I had a much more negative experience with women than men in our organization supporting the direction we wanted to go, and I've heard other women talk about how female gender is much harder on other women than men are. Can you speak to this issue? And Maybe I'd ask Lindsay to weigh in on that first. Sure, I can start with that. I mean, it, it's, it, this is um, some research that we're conducting right now that I didn't include as part of the webinar where we actually start to look at some of these characteristics of the rater as well. Um, so what I, what I talked about today were, you know, age of the leader, um, gender of the leader, the, the dominate, the uh, industry uh, breakout of male versus female industry dominated workplaces. But we are starting to kind of take what we know at that basic level and start to look at the gender of the rater. So how does that dynamic change um, when male versus female leaders are rated by male versus female raters? And so part of what we find speaks 
to um, a little bit of, of what you've experienced in that this, the findings of um, having women leaders tend to be rated higher than their male leader counterparts is more true when you're looking at male raters. Um, and I think you see that a little bit when in the glass ceiling study that I talked about where um, we were looking at top management's perceptions of male versus female leaders and you were seeing female leaders being rated higher, the majority of the top management, the vast majority, were males. And even when you look at other rater groups, peers, direct reports, um, women tend to be rated more favorably by male raters than they do by other female raters. Barbara, would you like to weigh in on that question? Sure. Um, you know, I think it's 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 a great one because you know there's I, I don't know if it was Madeline Albright, but it was um, some woman leader who made the comment that there's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. Um, and so you know, you asked about references before. Well, one of the classic ones is by Rosabeth Moss Cantor, um, Men and Women of the Organization, and she was the one who decades ago identified the dynamic of tokenism and wrote about the queen bee effect. Um, you know, and all these are some negative dynamics that happen when we have just a small percentage of women in senior leadership position. And so again, the recent, you know, discussions about um, do women have the role models at senior levels and do we have the sponsorship? And so also getting at that, those kind of questions and also the race question is some interesting research by Stacey Blake Beard and her colleagues at Simmons, the Simmons School of Management. And um, she's looked at both mentoring relationships for um, women as well as, um, you know, so cross-gender and, and same-gender mentoring relationships and also cross-racial cross mentoring relationships. And so, and the importance of um, having those kind of developmental opportunities and that kind of mentoring and sponsorship for, um, for developing ourselves as leaders and, again, allowing men and women and and you know, um, people of different races, their their voices to be heard in organizations. So those are a couple other interesting um, sources to look at. Um, again, you know, Rosabeth Marcanter, a very classic study, um, probably focuses more on some of that first generation biases that we had talked about. Um, but in general, anybody interested again in, in mentoring and um, you know differences across races or cultures, um, you know, like the Denison research, my research is in the preliminary stages of looking. Um, looking abroad, um, uh, I do have about 25% so far of my database is um, non-North American and, um, you know, looking at some, some differences and how they might correlate against men and women as well. So, um, so I guess for all of us, stay tuned for that one. Thanks, Barbara. I think we have time for one final question. Um, this one is for, from Brianna and it's for Lindsay. And the question is, uh, do you have any practical examples of addressing these sorts of challenges that we've talked about today with organizations that you've worked with? Sure. I think uh, that's, that's, a, that's a really interesting question and we've got a lot of examples of that. Um, you know, we have a couple of different organizations that we've worked with and interestingly enough they've both been um, in male-dominated industries and largely male-dominated workforces that have created um, and developed women in leadership programs. Um, they've utilized our, our 360 instrument, but really that's just kind of been the tip of the iceberg um, in terms of the, the programs they, that, that they've created to, um, to help coach, mentor, and develop women leaders. And so, um, you know, I can speak a little bit more specifically to that. And interestingly enough, that industry study um, that I talked about was actually sparked by one of our clients who wanted to know the answer to that question because they were, uh, uh, working in a male-dominated industry and wanting to be able to provide more directed advice and guidance for their female leaders and be able to better meet their, um, their needs. And so they wanted us to do a research study to look at, you know, what are the particular challenges for female leaders in male-dominated industries so that they could tailor a development program specifically to them. Uh, but I think uh, a Perhaps a better way to answer that question would be to tell you to kind of stay tuned to part two of the webinar series because we've got a lot of um, really amazing C-level um, women who will be speaking to their experiences in, in the organization.
organizations that they work in and organizations prior, um, how they've come, overcome some barriers, what they've done to be able to um, continue to excel their careers, and how they've instilled um, practices within their own organizations um, to, to address some of these challenges. So next, next week's webinar series, we'll talk a lot more to the how-to through the mouths of some of women who have had a lot of experience with this issue. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Lindsay and Barbara, for such an engaging discussion today. And thanks for our, to our audience for posing such great questions. Um, we'll be providing a link to the recording of today's session, uh, as well as the slides that were presented. Those will be available on our website. And um, you know, if you haven't already marked your calendars, I'd highly encourage everyone to join us at the same time next week for part two that Lindsay was just describing. So we will look forward to seeing you then. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.